Welcome to NOAA Live. My name is Grace Simpkins, and I'm going to be moderating today's webinar. This series is sponsored by NOAA's Regional Collaboration Network, which is spread across the country and helps connect people to all that NOAA does. It's also sponsored by Woods Hole Sea Grant, where I work, located at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution here on Cape Cod in Massachusetts. To find out about future webinars, we're in the Pacific Islands and Hawaii all week. You can look under the Woods Hole Sea Grant Education tab on our webpage or simply follow us on Facebook. We are so excited, believe it or not, this is our 25th webinar in a series designed to help you get to know NOAA and some of our incredible experts during these months of school closures. All of our speakers work for some part of NOAA. You'll hear me say that, and for those of you that are regulars, you know that stands for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And today, it is my pleasure to be introducing you to Malia Evans. Now, she is from NOAA's Papahanao Mokuakea Marine National Monument in Hawaii. While we'll be talking about archeology span and the National Monument, we wanna recognize that we are all coming to you from the traditional lands of native communities who have substantial traditional and local knowledge and much to share with us. We acknowledge that Malia is coming to us from the ancestral Hawaiian lands and seas. We are hosting this webinar from the ancestral lands of the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe and the Wampanoag tribe of Gay Hedaquina. A few guidelines for those of you that this might be your first webinar. You are all muted because we have a lot of people on the line and we wanna make sure that we can hear Malia. However, as you've already discovered, if you've told us where you're from, there's a box where you can write questions and we encourage you to write questions. I'll be keeping track of them for Malia and she will stop every now and then to answer a few. We may not get to all of your questions, but we'll try to answer as many as we can. So keep them coming and I'll keep track for Malia. All right, enough of me talking. I know that you're eager to hear Malia's talk as I am as well. So Malia, it's all yours. Oh, mahalo Grace. It's such a pleasure to be here with all of you. Aloha friends, so glad that you could join me today for Stories in the Stone, Archaeology in Papa Hanau Mokuakea Marine National Monument. Before I start my presentation, I'd like, you to in, I'd like to introduce you all to NOAA and the research and conservation work that we do. So if Grace, you could play that video for us. I am gonna get that video going right now. Here it comes. <laughs> Well, that was so exciting, and hopefully one of you out there may be interested in science and conservation and join us one day at NOAA when you get older. But right now, we are going to start our time together by going back in time and space to the origins of the universe. As we listen to this Hawaiian creation chant, the Kumulipo. The Kumulipo or, or an Oli recounts the birth of various organisms throughout its 2,100 lines of poetic verse. 
beginning in the deep darkness of coal, the first organism that is born is a tiny coral polyp. Make sure you are in a safe space to close your eyes, take a deep breath, and listen carefully. The Kumulipu chant, the creation chant, is also a genealogy and connects the chief it was composed for to the gods. It also is a classification system for living organisms. In science, we call that taxonomy. The first organism that emerged from coal, that deep darkness, was the coral polyp. Scientists know that coral and coral reefs are like the rainforest of the ocean, and they support all manner of life. Throughout the oli, or the chant, different organisms in the ocean and on the land are born, some of them in pairs. And this is a recounting of the natural history of the planet from a Hawaiian perspective. Something really interesting is occurring in this chant as well, and it's that the humans aren't even born until halfway through this 2,100 lines. And that's a really, really cool concept because if you think about it, if all of these other living organisms are born before us, that makes us as humans, the younger brothers and sisters of all of these other organisms. And so that's a really important concept when you look at the world around us, the natural environment, that we have a kuleana, if you can repeat that after me, kuleana. Good job. So kuleana means responsibility, but it also means privilege. And so we as human beings have a kuleana responsibility to take care of all of the natural world and the planet all around us. Grace, do we have any questions? I'm glad you asked, Malia. We do have some questions, and I encourage you while I'm asking, Malia, you can write your questions in that question box if some um, happen. So, Ifan Cullum, I love it when um, some of our um, regulars ask these questions. What is your favorite part of your job? Oh, my favorite part is being with um, the students that come to our center because I work in education and outreach. I get to interact with students from little ones who are like three and four years old, all the way up to kupuna or the elders in our community. And my favorite part is being able to share information about Papahanaumokuakea and get people to have like a little bit of a light bulb going off in their head about how important this place is and how important ancestral knowledge and wisdom is for us today. Thanks for that question. So, um, London is asking, what's your favorite part about the islands that you study? Oh, you know, I recently had a very, very fortunate opportunity to go up there last year. So the islands that I study are very remote and it's very difficult to get out there. There's a lot of permitting and there's a process you have to get through. So only education and research um, is allowed in these islands. And so being able to go there last year was my first time up in these islands. And it was an incredible experience. I felt like I was connecting with my ancestors. 
and being able to look at the archaeology and the places that they left is just a, a really incredible feeling when you make those kind of connections with your ancestors. Thanks for that great question. And Joshua is wondering what your favorite animal is that you've seen in your studies. Oh, I really love um, he'e or octopus. Those are one of my favorites. They're so intelligent and they're um, just incredible animals that have all these adaptations so that they're able to survive and thrive. Great. And um, Nate, Nate is wondering how long you've worked for NOAA. So I have been um, with NOAA and the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation for almost two years now. So lucky me. Nice. So I have one last question before um, we let you move on. Michael, Laura, and Julian were all wondering how did you get your job? And Dylan was wondering how did you choose your job? And that, that seemed to all be asking the same thing. So I thought maybe you could answer that. And then we're willing to and eager to hear everything else you have to share with us. Yeah, so, you know, it's really important as a young person to understand what it is that you want to do when you get older. And so I've been working in cultural resource management, which includes in Hawaii, there's no difference between cultural and natural resources. They're pretty much just all of the same thing. And so I've been working um, for about 15 years in cultural resource management, which means taking care of all those beautiful cultural and archaeological sites and the stories that go with them. And so I was fortunate to see this job, especially here, I was coming, I was moving home to Hilo, which is where I was born and raised. And I saw this job for the, the job that I'm working now. And so I applied and was able to get it. So thanks for that question. So now that I've introduced all of my older brothers and sisters who are part of the natural environment, I'm going to introduce myself. My name is Malia Kapua Onalani Evans, and I am the descendant of one of the greatest voyaging cultures on Earth. Hawaiians voyaged across the largest ocean in the world to make their home in the Hawaiian archipelago. This photo here shows me and my younger brothers and sisters that are in our ohana, in our family. So one of the cool things about my family is we are really big. I'm the number 11 child of 12 children that were born to Blossom Kalama and James Evans. So I come from a really big family. And in this picture, we are with our grandfather, Noah Kahalekoa Kalama, who continued the voyaging traditions as a coach of many Hawaiian outrigger canoe paddling clubs. So when I was a kid, I would see all of these beautiful stone structures all around me when I was growing up. And I always wondered, I said, who made these? What was the story behind them? What was their function? And every time I saw them, I wondered, about all those untold stories in all of those stones. So even after I became an adult, I never forgot those stone structures and, the, and their stories. So after high school, I started a family. I have five children and I have six grandchildren. And here's my newest, Kia Ikupono. He's seven months old. And so after I had all of my babies, then I decided to go to college. So it's never too late to go to school and learn new things. So I was always the oldest one in my classes, but that's okay because I was there to learn. And so I went to college and I got my bachelor's in anthropology, and then I got my master's in applied archeology. span And I have been working to protect and to educate people about cultural and archaeological sites ever since. So what is archaeology? Is it the study of dinosaurs and their bones? Maybe the study of oceans and the animals that live there? Could it be the study of clouds and weather patterns? Or maybe it's the study of things people made, used, and left behind. What do you think? 
Okay, great question, Malia. So go ahead and vote. I see that we have um, some folks, Kyle says uh, B and Ellie says A and D. We have a couple of Rebecca's also saying A and D. Um, but I have to say the majority, the overwhelming majority of um, folks like Annabelle and Ariana and Robin and um, Eli and Jackson are all saying D, the study of things people made, used, and left behind. We have a pretty savvy group. I'm not sure if I told you that, but they're, uh, they're pretty good. I can tell they're very savvy. So, Hololé, good job. You got that correct. It is. It is the study of the things that people made, used, and left behind so that we can understand what people were like and what kind of lifestyle they were living. So, good job. So one of the most interesting archeological sites in all of Hawaii are on two of the remote islands northwest of the main Hawaiian islands, as you can see on this map. So these islands are Nihoa. Can you, re can you repeat that after me? Nihoa. And the other island is Moku Mana Mana. Repeat that after me. Moku Mana Mana. Maika'i, good job. So it's really interesting because Hawaiian names can give you a lot of descriptive information about places. And so Nihoa, one of the meanings is that it's jagged or toothed. And then the island Moku Mana Mana, Moku means island or a district. And Mana Mana has many meanings. Mana Mana can mean like branches or rays. Mana is also spiritual power. So when it's doubled like that, mana mana, it could mean great spiritual power. And so these are really important because Hawaiian words can have many meanings and many, many different translations as well. So here we are. And that's why I'm so happy to work for NOAA and the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation as an educator and in Native Hawaiian outreach, because they help to protect this special place called Papahanao Mokuakea. Do you see this picture? This is one of the coolest pictures I have ever seen in my life. Do you see that face in the island of Nihoa? So this picture was taken last year when I was able to go up to the monument. And as we were approaching Nihoa, we all, all of the research um, people that were on the ship noticed this face looking out from the island. And then later when I looked at the photo, I could also see that there was another face that was up in the clouds. Can you see it? There's the face there. There's the eyes, there's the nose. And it seems as if the two faces are looking at each other. And what's really cool is that this reminds me about the naming of this very special place. So the oral tradition or the story begins with the two ancestors whose coming together created the Hawaiian archipelago and the Hawaiian people. Papa Hanaumoku is our goddess mother who gives birth to the islands and the Hawaiian people. Wakia is her partner who represents the broad expanse of the sky and the concept of time. Let's practice saying this name together that honors our Hawaiian ancestors. Papa, Hanau, Moku, Akia. Okay, let's put it all together. Papa Hanau Moku Akea. My Kai. Good job. So the name Papa Hanau Moku Akea was given to honor our ancestors and to acknowledge the connection that we have to these elder islands, the seas, and the animals and plants that make their home there. So take a look at the globe where you can see where our Hawaiian archipelago is. It's right in the middle of the biggest ocean on the planet. And on the map, 
you can see the islands, atolls, reefs, and seas that make up our archipelago. And right here, if you look, see that line that goes around these older islands, our Kupuna Islands? That is what the monument encompasses. There's over 582,000 square miles of ocean and land within the monument. And you know what's really cool? We have over 7,000 different varieties of animals and organisms, and one fourth of them are endemic. Endemic means that you cannot find them anywhere else in the world. So a very, very special place. So I have two questions for you. What is the name of the ocean that surrounds Hawaii? And what is an archipelago? Two really great questions, Malia. All right, so first of all, go ahead and weigh in. What is the name of the ocean that surrounds Hawaii? And again, we have a very savvy crew, so I'm seeing everybody putting down that right answer. We have Joshua and May and Robin and Mary and Beatrix. Everybody knows. It's the Pacific Ocean. Now, here's a trickier question, folks. So you've put in the Pacific Ocean, what is an archipelago? So do any of you know what an archipelago, oh my goodness, I'm telling you, this crew, I would love to have you in uh, my classroom. So Barb says that it's a chain of islands. Jennifer says the same. Um, Te Texas is also saying that, Dwayne and Mary, and Iris and Robin, they're all saying that it's a chain of islands. You are absolutely correct. It is a chain of islands. And if you noticed on our map, you saw that they moved from the northwest down into the southeast. So it is a ch chain of islands. And it's a very, very long chain of islands. It's over 1,500 miles long from our youngest island of Hawaii to our oldest island of Ho'olaniku. So, if we know that an archipelago is a chain of islands, what natural process created these islands? And we are gonna watch a short video and then discuss that. If we can pull that video up, Grace, please. So I'm gonna pull up that video, but I think Malia did ask you a question and a lot of folks are weighing in, so I just wanna let you know that okay. Joshua, Aoife and Cullum, Annabelle and Nate have already said, they think it's volcanoes. So I'm going to queue up that video and we'll see if they are right. Mm Okay, and Malia, while you're getting your slides go, just to reassure you all, I should have let you know ahead of time, there was not sound on that video. So if you were worried about your sound, I'm sorry, there was there was no sound. We just wanted you to see all of that um, amazing volcanic activity. And it is so amazing. So what you just witnessed was what was going on here about two years, around this time, yeah, May 2018, was the most recent volcanic eruption that was occurring in Kilauea and it's a beautiful process but it's a destruct it's always destructive but it's also creating that's brand new island that's being created by our Tutu Pele or the goddess of the volcano Pele and we we um, can see all of that lava that's coming out and just pouring forth and making brand new land and so here on the island that I'm on Hawaii Island 
we actually have three volcanoes that are still considered active. And it's part of living on these islands that having volcanic eruptions has been part of my life growing up here and continues to be a part of the life of many of the children that live here as well. So we know that all of you who said volcanoes, you are absolutely right. So if we think about where the volcanoes are, we know, I bet you folks know about this, right? We've got this, the hot spot that's sitting directly below Hawaii Island, it's stationary, it doesn't move. But then we have these tectonic plates that sit on the crust of the earth and they're moving. They're moving to the northwest. And that's why our islands, if you look at this archipelago, the hot spots right here, and all of these islands are being dragged over very, very, very slowly to the northwest. So once upon a time, these old islands here, 28 million years ago, this island of Polaniku was sitting right directly over that hotspot. And through time, it's being dragged over to the northwest. About as fast, if you look at my fingernails, yeah, the plate moves about as fast as a fingernail will grow in one year. So this is like two months growth since we started our quarantine. So think about that two times six, maybe about that much. That's how fast the, the plate is moving in one year. Maybe about the same amount of time it takes for you to grow in a year, yeah? So it's a really cool process of creation and birth brand new islands coming up, and then the eventual death of an island. As the islands, as they get older, they sink and subside under the ocean, and eventually they'll totally disappear from the surface. So do we have any questions, Grace? We do. We always have um, quite a few questions, which I love. I love getting all these questions. So Andrea asks, have you been able to visit all of the different islands? I think seeing how many different ones there are there. Have you been to all of them? I have not. So when I went out on the research vessel last summer, we were able, we, we journeyed from Oahu here, and we made our way past Nihoa. We went past Mokumanamana. We went to Lalo. We went all the way up here to Kamoku or Kamohualii Maro Reef. And then we turned around and we came all the way back. So I'm hoping that one day I'll be able to visit the other islands as different research projects are, are unfolding there. Thanks for that great question. Great. And we have a question from Coralie. I'm not sure if. Um if she saw our presentation last week, but we had someone talking about the albatross and they told us that the albatross came to your islands and then would go back. This was someone from Cordell Bank National Marine Sanctuary in California. So Coralie wants to know if you've ever seen an albatross. I have seen an albatross. Some of them, actually there's some really nice uh, reserves here on Oahu. One is called Kaena. There's another one over in Kahuku, the James Campbell Refuge. And so we are so lucky that the albatross have chosen to use these areas as their birthing places and to, to lay their eggs. Up here in our northwest in Papahanaumokuakea is where the majority of the, the Laysan albatross or the moli actually return to lay their eggs because if you think about it they need a place they're ground dwellers right they're ground nesters so their eggs are laid on the ground so if they're in areas where there's a lot of people or animals like mongooses or dogs and cats that's a really not a good place for them to be laying their eggs right so these islands are so important because they're remote there's not a lot of people there and the animals are able to do what they naturally do without any kind of disturbance. So thank you for that question. I love it that you know about the Laysan albatross. 
Great. Thanks so much for telling us. It's nice to make connections between the different webinars as well. If you want to know more about the Albatross, you can take a look. It's already uh, The video is already up, um, Jennifer Stock's video. But we have some questions about um, the volcanoes and sort of the age of the islands. So Connor and Daniel are wondering, are there older islands that are underwater? And, and Joshua is wondering why you know, we hear a lot about Kauai and Oahu and Maui and, and sort of those islands, why we don't hear as much about the, the older islands. That, those are great questions. And so, yes, there are older islands that were created from the same hotspot, and they're all underwater. So up here, they're called the Emperor Seamounts, and they actually run more all in a southwest direction. There's like a bend that happened here. And they go all the way up towards Alaska. And so those are called the Emperor Sea Mounts. They are the older islands, much, much, much older than these islands here. Our oldest island that's in Papahanaumokuakea is about 28 million years old. And so really, really a long time that these islands have been forming and then kind of just subsiding and getting smaller, yeah? And what was the other question, Grace? So they were just wondering um, why we tend to hear so much about the islands that are sort of on the lower right, but we don't we don't normally hear a lot of the names of the ones that are part of the National Monument. Excellent question. So in Hawaii, the Hawaiians here have always remembered these islands because we call them our kupuna islands. Kupuna means like the elders. And so in Hawaiian um, mo'olelo or history, these islands have been remembered, but when it comes to um, contemporary times when we live in modern times, a lot of times people don't know that there's these other islands that exist. And so that's part of our job is to let people know, educate people about why they're so important, not only for the Hawaiian people, but for all of the animal species that make their home here. So now that you folks know about it, you can share that information with other people so more people can learn about Papahanaumokuakea. Excellent. I think it's pretty exciting to be able to share something that others maybe haven't heard of as well. And you can educate them a little bit about the Hawaiian archipelago. Um, so one last, um, let's see. So I'm going to ask you one last question. And then I have a question that I know you're going to get to. So I want to just share with you Finn's question. This one I don't want you to answer yet, Malia, because I think you're going to get to it. But Finn asked what kind of animals the Polynesians brought when they came. So I just wanted you to have that in your back pocket. But um, the question that I wanted to ask you before we went on, and I'm wondering if this is one of our friends from Alaska, is they're wondering if the Aleutian Islands are from the same hot spot. So I think they're thinking about that chain of islands as well. Great question. And you know what? I don't even know the answer to that one. So maybe you can go and check that out and find out if those are part of the same hotspot. That's a great question. I'll do my research and then you do your research, okay? Thank you. I like to I like to give the kids um, some research projects, so I appreciate you giving them an assignment to look up. All right, I'm going to hold on to the rest of the questions and let you go on because I know you have so many exciting things, Malia. All right. So one of the really important questions is what about the people, right? How did the Hawaiian people get to the most isolated archipelago in the world? Let's find out by watching this video. If Grace, if you could pull that one up, please. Seven thousand years ago, the first really oceanic people came out of China, and it came out of Taiwan. Thousand years after that, spreading through the Pacific Islands in Melanesia, even in Indonesia. Then you get to Polynesia. 
this oceanic country bounded by Hawaii in the north and New Zealand in the southwest and Rapa Nui in the east. 10 million square miles, 600 times more water than this land, biggest country on earth, bigger than Russia. And it was discovered by these extraordinary people. And I say extraordinary because you could argue that they were really the astronauts of our ancestors. They were the greatest explorers on the face of the earth. These extraordinary explorers accomplished these amazing feats without the use of modern instruments, but by relying solely on an innate connection to the winds, waves, and the stars. With the passing of time and the arrival So they're incredible people. Remember, they didn't do any of this with GPS or with cell phones. They had to learn how to navigate by being deep observers of the environment and being able to understand how the ocean currents move, how the winds and the wind patterns and the different weather events. And they had to do this across the largest ocean in the world. So it's a pretty incredible feat when you think about it. So once they arrived, our ancestors settled among the main Hawaiian islands. Some of them continued their long distance journeys across the Pacific. And we've thrived here for over 1,500 years. Hawaiian skills in voyaging allowed them to expand beyond the main younger islands and venture into the older Northwest islands of the archipelago. So, as you can see, here are some canoes that were, here's Hokulea, and I believe this one is Hiki Analia that have done some journeys up into the Northwest Hawaiian Islands up in Papahanaumokuakea. So what I want you folks to do is imagine that you are going on one of those canoes, but not now, 500 years ago, where there was no GPS, there were no cell phones, there was nothing that you could use in technology that would help you to get there. So I want you to think about this. Imagine you're on that journey. You're going to get ready to go. You're going to go from Hawaii Island all the way to Nihua, which is about 500 miles. Think about this. What would you take and why? That is a great question. All right. So what would you take if you were making that journey? What do you think would be important for you to take with you? Um, so Ellie's saying, and George both, if they had compasses, they think that comp a compass would be really important to figure out where they're going. Jennifer says food, and Joshua takes it a step further and says a fishing pole. Um, mm -hmm. We have Robin who says fresh water, and Beatrix says maybe fish net. And Duncan agrees, uh, food and fresh water. Connor and Daniel are saying maybe you want to take a chicken with you. I guess they're thinking about, you know, having some food that you can grow once you get there. And Iris says, of course, you want to have your fish hooks. Paul says a star map. Um, yeah, a lot. And, and Olivia says tools. Eli says maybe firewood in case where you're going doesn't have um, any wood there. So that seems to be the comprehensive list. I think I've, oh, and Audrey has a great idea. Um, Audrey says, take some seeds. Mm. Oh, you folks are great survivalists. I think you all would do very well colonizing brand new islands. So all of those things are so important, right? Your food, your water, the star map, right? Because you need to know where you're going. And people had that knowledge all in their heads. And then also, being an animal is so smart, right? So someone had asked, was it Finn asked about the animals that Polynesians brought as they colonized different islands? And so one of them was a chicken. They also brought pigs. And then there were other plants that were really important plants that we call the canoe plants that were really valuable that they would bring on these long distance journeys so that they could have and plant those, those plants and be able to have all of the materials, the food, all of those really important trees and plants 
that Hawaiians um, needed to survive. So great, you folks are good survivalists. I'll take you on my va'a, okay? So just imagine, here we have come to the island of Nihua after our 500 mile voyage from the island of Hawaii. Let's look at this video and see what's, what it looks like. I did feel like watching that video that I was um, on one of the boats looking at the island that did a good simulation of, of making me feel it. Yeah, too bad it wasn't a little longer, but it gives you the sense of what it would be like to approach Nihoa on a canoe. And you can see those big, this 900 foot cliffs. And it, remember when I, when I talked about what Nihoa means? It means like jagged or toothed. This kind of looks like a tooth, if you think about it, like a molar jutting up from the ocean. So very good descriptive name for Nihoa. So here we are, we're on our va'a, and we're gonna go on to the island of Nihoa. But first we have to swim, right? So I'm hoping that all of you are good swimmers, practice your swimming skills, because we're gonna have to swim from that canoe, that va'a, and get onto the island of Nihoa. And once we're here, ooh, where I lost my place here. Yeah, there we are. Okay, so once we're here, we get on the island and then we have to climb up the steep trails while dodging the thousands of native birds that live here. Always remembering that we are entering a sacred place where we need to be respectful. As we climb the steep trails, we come across stone structures built at different locations across this small steep island. What questions do you have about these structures? Okay, so this is a great question. So what Malia is asking you to do, if you were to walk, be walking across the island and you see these, what sort of questions would they uh, bring to mind? What uh, what would you be thinking? So for example, Ellie is saying she would wonder how old are they and who made them? Duncan says the same, how old are they? Annabella agrees, who made them? Um, Charisse says, who put the structures there and, and what were they for? So um, Sloan is wondering, did native people make them? Josh was wondering if it's a grave. Nate's just wondering, what do they mean? Um, and Jennifer's wondering, did someone live inside the structure? Mm -hmm. Oh, great questions. And that's what archaeologists do, right? They ask those questions. Who made these structures? What were they for? What, was the, what, what did they mean? And so those are really, really good questions to be asking when you come upon places like this. And so we've had archaeologists work in these, in these islands who've been researching and doing field work for over 100 years. The first archaeologist here on Nihua was Dr. Kenneth Emery, who came here about 100 years ago and did some surveys and some excavation of these sites to answer those questions. And recently, the most recent archaeologist to work here is Dr. Kekueva Kikiloi, who did a lot of field work and research on these islands to understand what our ancestors were doing and what were they building and why were they building all these beautiful structures. And so archeologists are like detectives. There's clues that are left behind. And by looking at the evidence, by the things that you find, by looking at some of the styles of the different building techniques, by looking at if you excavate, you can see, oh, are there tools here? Are there pieces of plants where charcoal maybe was burned? And then you can understand carbon dating and be able to get a date of when people were settling this area or occupying these sites. So there's a lot of wonderful questions that archaeology can answer 
by doing research and field work. So yes, this is a cave, it's a cave shelter. And as you can see, there was like a wall that was built up around it to kind of create a more protective area. Many of the sites here are actually house sites. So people, our ancestors were living here on Nihoa. There's also agricultural terraces. So did you notice when we first got to the island how steep the island is? That's not really good for soil retention if you wanna be planting things, right? So these walls were built as retaining walls, as terraces, so that crops like sweet potato, which was a really good crop to grow in places where there's not a lot of water. And so lots of different agricultural terraces, house sites, there's also heiau, which are like ceremonial temples. And there was some burials here. So archeologists have been studying this to understand what was going on on Nihoa. And so lots of great um, questions and also lots of great evidence that was gathered. And so Dr. Kiki, Kiki Loy's um, research indicates that this island was kind of like a support island for the next island that we're gonna be visiting. So it's time to say aloha to Nihoa. And we are gonna continue on our journey of the story of the stones. And then we're gonna get back on board our va'a on our canoe and sail 180 miles northwest and come upon the island of Moku Mana Mana. Can you say that name after me? Moku Mana Mana. Yes, remember we were talking about the meaning of the name? Moku is like an island. And then mana mana can mean branches or rays or even great spiritual power. And we're going to find out a little bit more about that great spiritual power. So we're sitting offshore in our canoe. And before we approach Moku mana mana, we have to understand that it is a very sacred place and very culturally significant to Hawaiians. We can see all of the stone structures and the stone uprights that are built along the ridge line of this tiny volcanic island. Why were they built? All the way out here in the remote Northwest Islands and for what purpose? So archeologists and native Hawaiian scholars have been uncovering many clues here. So some of the structures, actually most of the structures on this island are heiau, ceremonial temples that were used for ceremony and ritual activities. The, a lot of the heiau here actually have an east to west orientation. And we know that there's several bodies in the heavens that move east to west, right? Sun, the moon, stars and planets. So do you think maybe that they were being used as celestial observation? That's what our scholars and archeologists have been doing some research on. And the artifacts, oh, another thing. So these upright stones here, they're called mana mana. Another really cool thing about the island Moku Mana Mana, they're equally spaced. And the artifacts found here are more ceremonial. So when they were doing their um, archeological survey, they found a lot of images that were used for ceremony. Another really, really important aspect of Moku Mana Mana is its location on the Tropic of Cancer. See that line right there? In Hawaiian, we call it Keala, Keala Polohiva Akane. And it's a boundary between Po and Ao. So in Po, remember we did the Kumulipo, the chant that we were listening to earlier? So Po is that place of the afterlife, the creation, that dark, deep darkness. And so Po is the world of the ancestors and the afterlife. And Ao is a world of light and human beings. And so scholars from the Edith Kanaka Ole Foundation continue to study the temples and the manamana or the uprights, especially during solar events 
to make the summer solstice and the winter solstice and the equinox. So lots of celestial observations that were going on on these islands. And if you think about it, Hawaiians needed to know, right? They're dependent on their natural environment to voyage. They're dependent on the changing of the seasons in order for their planting and the harvesting. They're dependent to be able to know how to navigate and so also how to tell time. So this is a very, very important place. The location of the island on the Tropic of Cancer and this significance to the Hawaiian culture and voyaging have led some archaeologists to theorize that the entire island might be one large sacred site instead as opposed to a complex of different sites. More research and fieldwork needs to be conducted to fully understand this sophisticated system of accounting for time, for weather and climate, for, for forecasting that, and for navigational training. Some of the things that were collected on the islands are called artifacts, and these are all made out of stone. Artifacts are objects that are made or modified by humans. Several unique stone images were manufactured and placed within the heiau of Mokumana Mana. Nowhere else in the Hawaiian archipelago can you find images like these. And here we have a stone bowl, and here we have an ad. So this is probably the best tool you could have in your toolkit is a stone ads. But you gotta think about this, right? No metal. So all of these objects were used with other rocks that were being used to shape and form all of these beautiful objects. So stone, it's so abundant, right? In Hawaii, we have so much stone and they were being made into very useful and into ceremonial objects as well. So, as we have seen through this presentation, there are different ways to record and pass on important information. Here in Hawaii, we study the oral traditions like our chants, our mo'olelo, our stories, and songs that Hawaiians have memorized, recited, and passed down for generations. We also use archaeology to study the sites and artifacts that Hawaiians made, used and left behind to learn more about our ancestors and ourselves. Grace, do we have any questions? You know, we do have some questions, but I think I know you um, are going to share with us how to make a petroglyph, and I am very excited. And I want to make sure we have time to do that because I want to encourage all of the kids that are on to, um, to make a petroglyph, and then um, after you tell us how, I'm going to tell them how they can submit a picture. So I'm going to hold on to the questions and let you get to that just in the interest of time um, so that they can see, because I think that's so exciting, the way you show us how to make um, a recording of our family and our history. So I'm going to let you do that, Malia. Absolutely, and that's important, yeah? Is how is information and memories recorded and transmitted in your family or your community? Imagine that you have to explain what's important to you, your family, or your community without speaking or writing. And that's what we are going to do today. We are going to create our own ki'i pohaku. So repeat after me. Ki'i pohaku. Ki'i pohaku. My ka'i. So ki'i pohaku are images that are carved into stone. In this case, petroglyphs. We find these ancestral drawings near major trails and places where people traveled or gathered. Some ki'i pohaku connect certain families to certain places. Some record generations of family members, like a genealogy. Some record important people or events that happened. Some record animals or activities that are taking place. So, perhaps the story of this petroglyph is that this turtle tells a story of a beach where turtles come to lay their eggs in the nice soft sand. Maybe this middle one 
tells a story about a certain species of fish that migrates from one place to another. And maybe this one is a story of a voyager who's gazing up at the heavens and watching the sun and the moon move from east to west. So I want you to think about the story that you want to tell, yeah? And what you're going to do is you are going to gather up whatever you have. We are going to practice something called aloha aina. Aloha aina means love for your land and for your natural environment. So you choose whatever you got that's around you. You can use a paper bag. You can use an old box. You can use a cereal box. My favorites, we all should have some of these. Yes, very good for all kind of things. So look around your house, see what you can use to draw on. Alrighty, once you have your material, this is what you're going to do. So I am using a box here. And basically, you're going to get your pencil, your crayon, whatever it is that you want to. And so I'm going to draw a honu. A honu is a turtle, really, really important animals that nest in Papahanao Mokuakea. So I'm going to do the body of the turtle. Then I'm going to do the head of the turtle. Then we'll do its flippers. And so you draw it out. Once you have your drawing done, make sure it's simple. Make sure it's not complicated. Because what you're going to do after that is you're going to get your glue, whatever kind of glue you got, and you are going to trace the outline of the image that you drew. So what's going to happen after that? So you got to let that glue dry. It usually takes overnight. So after you got your glue on your image, put it in a safe place. If you have animals or little brothers and sisters, put it somewhere flat in a safe place and let it dry overnight. So once that's done and you wake up early in the morning and you're all excited because you're going to make your kii pohaku, what you're going to do is you're going to get your image and you're going to feel that the glue dried really nice on there. Then get your paper. And again, reuse whatever you have. Aloha aina. Here's a paper bag. I'm just using a very thin paper bag. And I'm going to place that right over my kii pohaku. Get my crayon. I noticed that you know what works really, really good is crayons and pencils. And then you're just going to color over use the side of your crayon yeah it's better that way instead of the point and there's your kiipohaku and what's the cool thing is is that this is your story yeah it's a story about you and so as you can see here, the marker didn't work so good. I wouldn't recommend markers. So crayons and colored pencils are the best to use. But I'm so happy that you folks are, were able to join me today and learning a little bit about the stories in the stones of Papa Hanau Moku Akea and the ways Hawaiians transmit important information. You are free to visit our website, do your own research, and I hope that you continue to look for the stories in your ohana, in your family, and in your community. Aloha. Thank you so much, Malia. I know that I speak for everyone who is on the webinar and saying how enjoyable it was. It was lovely to hear all of the different Hawaiian words and learn how to pronounce them. Someone was asking me how to pronounce the name of the National Monument, which I have to say I practiced a lot, Papahadnao Mokuakea. But the uh, pronunciation, there is a really nice website that tells you all about the name if you visit the Noah Live um, if you just Google Woodsell Sea Grant Noah Live, there's a file there and it tells you how to pronounce it. You can listen to it um, as well as some of the other resources that Malia uh, referenced as well as a place for you to submit your photograph. So if you make a petroglyph, we would love to see a picture of it. So if you visit the Noah Live website, 
you'll see that there is um, a link that says to submit your photograph for your petroglyph. And so we very much would appreciate you um, sending us a photo. And if you want to give us some information about what it represents for you and your family, we would love that as well, but only what you're comfortable sharing. Mostly we would just love the photograph. So Malia, thank you so much um, for just everything and sharing your culture with us, sharing your job. Uh, really exciting to hear about what NOAA is doing on the Pacific Islands and a great kickoff to the Pacific Islands um, NOAA Live series. I just want to say that if you um, want to stick with us at 3 o'clock Eastern, Eastern Daylight Time or um, 9 a.m. Hawaiian Time, on Wednesday we're going to hear from Keith Kamakawa. I hope I'm saying that right. And he's going to tell us about Hawaiian bonefish. So we have another webinar coming up on Wednesday. But again, thanks so much. We really enjoy um, everything. And if you also want to watch the recorded webinar, this will be posted probably by tomorrow just because it's late my time. Um, but you can watch Malia's webinar if you missed any of it or if you had so much fun and you want to recommend to somebody else that they watch it. Um, we'll be uh, encouraging people to do that and make their own petroglyphs for for as long as they want. So Malia, thanks again for having us. Those of you out there, we'll see you on Wednesday. And uh, mahalo for watching the, the webinar. All right. Mahalo. Aloha. Aloha, friends.